Good evening. For nearly 50 years, sightings of UFOs, unidentified flying objects, have provoked a mixture of excitement and derision. But amidst the ballyhoo, there is a small group of people whose testimony deserves to be taken seriously. They are the professional pilots, who are best placed literally to report and evaluate a UFO sighting. Tonight, serving pilots speak for the first time about UFOs they have seen and the pressures that prevented them from speaking out. There's no doubt they've all seen something. But what did they see? For almost 50 years now, military and civil pilots have been reporting strange objects in the sky. The very first UFO sighting from the air happened on the 24th of June, 1947. A pilot with the United States Forest Service was out searching for a missing plane over the Cascade Mountains in Washington State. Kenneth Arnold reported seeing nine bright objects in the sky, traveling at fantastic speed. He said they looked like a saucer would if you skipped it across water. Do you believe in flying saucers? Have you any convincing reasons why science fiction shouldn't one day become reality? The public were captivated. We have received and analyzed between one and two thousand reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. In Washington, ghost-like objects dart across the radar screen at the CAA traffic control center. At In the Cold War atmosphere of the times, the authorities were forced to respond to the growing public panic. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion, and that is that it does not contain any pattern that we can relate to any conceivable threat to the United States. But the first UFO death in January 1948 set a pattern of official secrecy and public suspicion. A group of P-51 Mustangs flying over Kentucky were requested to investigate a UFO. They detected a large object flying at high altitude. One of the pilots, Captain Thomas Mantell, gave chase, describing what he saw to ground control. It is a metallic object, he said, tremendous in size. I'm going in for a better look. Minutes later, Mantell crashed. The problem was that they didn't actually know what had happened to Mantell. There was no obvious explanation. So they had to hastily put together the conclusion that what he'd seen was the planet Venus and that he'd been trying to forlornly chase that. But this seemed an unlikely mistake for an experienced fighter pilot. Everybody, for the time at least, accepted it until the doubts began to grow that if they were prepared not to tell the truth about that, what was it that they were trying to hide? And in many senses, that was a great mistake that they made because that instigated the claims of a cover-up. Britain, too, had its flying saucer reports. Winston Churchill wrote a memo about them. What, he wanted to know, did it all amount to? Once again, it was the evidence of pilots that provoked most concern to the authorities. Anything received from our own RAF pilots was examined with very great care. Uh, we're talking about very highly trained people um, whose job in life is to fly about the skies uh, and not to be conned by optical illusions or clouds or whatever. Uh, so one had to take seriously what they were saying. There were several sightings by British pilots, but the authorities kept quiet about them. The Air Ministry would not have been keen to um, let it become public knowledge that some of our pilots had seen flying saucers. We had no explanation. Uh, uh, one could imagine the kind of tabloid headlines there would have been. We didn't want it. On the day of the eclipse of the sun, some of the crew and passengers of a BOAC strato cruiser... But while military sightings remained secret, reports from civil pilots escaped censorship. That's what it looked like, very roughly. I think there's no question that it was no illusion and that it was being intelligently handled. In 1954, BOAC Captain James Howard reported a sighting. It was uh, July the 29th, 1954, and we were en route to Goose Bay in Labrador, flying at our assigned altitude of 19,000 feet. It was a lovely summer evening. I was looking down on the left-hand side of the airplane, and I saw through broken cloud something moving alongside us. There were seven in all objects. There was one large one and six smaller ones. The big one also appeared to be changing its shape gradually and it stayed with us 
and the passengers became interested naturally. And in fact, everybody was agog. We couldn't tell the passengers what it was because we, we just didn't know. Some were laughing about it and some were saying, oh, it's, you know, Martians have landed and silly things like that, but um, no one knew. By the 1960s, UFO sightings had become common amongst the general public. There were 100 sightings alone in the village of Warminster in 1967. How many people here tonight are afraid of the thing? How many of you? <laughs> but the subject was no longer taken seriously. As the idea of flying saucers became more and more absurd, pilots were deterred from reporting sightings for fear of being open to ridicule. But in recent years, new information and new scientific methods have begun to provide rational explanations for some of the sightings of the past. In the Mantell case, for instance, there was a cover-up. The US Navy hadn't told the US Air Force about Skyhook, a secret high-altitude balloon. Mantell died trying to fly too high. We know that what he saw was this gigantic balloon, uh, which was well, at least 60,000 feet above the ground, at a height where Mantell's aircraft simply was incapable of going. This previously inexplicable UFO sighting was filmed in 1973 in Bedfordshire and witnessed by large numbers of people. Twenty years on, papers released through the American Freedom of Information Act revealed that a US jet fighter had run into trouble in the area and dumped fuel. The fuel appears to have formed some kind of a ball of orange fire. It was exactly at the point where the cloud layers began. There was a particularly unusual meteorological circumstance that day, which therefore appears to have caused a ball of fire to literally bounce along in the wake of the aircraft across the tops of the clouds. And when it finally disappeared... And meteorologists have come up with an explanation for Captain Howard's sighting, a mirage brought on by rare atmospheric conditions. It shrunk down until it was no more than just a, a speck. And then... Today's more rational climate is finally persuading pilots to come forward with their stories, like Graham Shepard, who saw a UFO in 1967. Now, the senior captain we were flying with at the time, he advised us strongly that we shouldn't report it, we should make no mention of it at all. And at that time, way back in 1967, he, he said quite clearly to us that it would compromise our careers if we'd talked about it. He now speaks for the first time. We were flying from Scotland back to London, cruising at about 24,000 feet. The Preston radar controller at the time, he advised us that we had fast moving opposite direction traffic in the airway, heading towards us at our 12 o'clock position, which was straight ahead. Now, of course, we looked out, three or three man crew, we looked out and into view almost immediately came a disc shaped craft. The sun was shining on it. I was looking down on a, a disc about 30 feet diameter with a slightly raised center portion, no markings that I can remember, but it was shining in the sunlight. It was certainly metallic. Any high speed airplane so close to us would have given us a bump. Now, the very curious thing about this very close approach is that it didn't uh, leave a shockwave. What we've got nowadays can't match what we saw 17 years ago. Two former crewmates meet up for the first time since 1978 when they flew together on a Dan Air flight from London to Malta. They believe they had a close encounter and are telling their story for the first time on television. It was a beautiful day. It was 8 eights blue absolutely gin clear and uh, as we looked out to the uh, right and about at a 60 degree angle through the, um, the aircraft's uh, cockpit uh, roof uh, we saw this large spherical object very bright very bright circular object now I noticed next to it a couple of smaller ones I pointed this out to the captain sitting next to me and we both looked at it for a few seconds and as we were watching it, they all disappeared in different directions at an incredible acceleration. I've spent quite a bit of time in the Air Force firing rockets and things like that and other weapons, but I've never seen anything accelerate as rapidly as this object. 
Many pilots who believe they've seen UFOs remark on the dramatic impact of the experience. Well, I've never seen anything like it in 25 years of flying now. It's the only time I've ever seen anything in the air that I couldn't explain. Up, up until this uh, particular incident, I'd, uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't been a believer in UFOs. I thought it was all uh, a figment of people's imaginations. But since that date, uh, I must admit, I'm a great believer. These recent accounts by pilots have not yet been closely analyzed. When they are, perfectly natural explanations may emerge. But air-to-air -air sightings remain the strongest UFO cases on record, and the most likely yet to yield up a story which might not be explained away. The most convincing UFO evidence would involve independent sightings by a number of pilots and confirmation by radar. There is one such case. It's called the Kaikoura Incident. This is the Kaikoura Peninsula in New Zealand. There's a regular air freight run between Wellington and Christchurch with a return stop at Blenheim and then back to Wellington. Now along this deserted coastline, fringed by the featureless expanse of the South Pacific, there were three detailed UFO sightings on one night. As you'll hear, the reports were made by professional pilots and backed up by ground observers. What's more, Wellington radar also tracked the objects. Then a film crew went up, and the pictures they brought back led to a government inquiry. The remarkable series of events began late on December the 20th, 1978, an apparently ordinary night at Wellington, New Zealand's busiest airport. Cargo planes were loading up for their routine runs, delivering freight to Christchurch, 200 miles away on South Island. The pilots were expecting a run-of-the-mill flight over the Pacific Ocean. Instead, they were about to embark on the strangest trip of their lives. The bizarre happenings began at the New Zealand RAF base in Blenheim, 70 miles from Wellington, just before midnight, as Warrant Officer Ian Uffendel, in charge of airport security, was finishing off his checks. I was doing my final rounds before retiring for the night, and driving up the tarmac, I noticed these lights, which I thought was a Bristol freighter. I stopped to watch the airplane approach and land, which it didn't do. This thing should have landed by now. At Wellington Airport that night, the phone call was answered by radar operator John Cordy. We've also got unidentified craft on the radar here. What's going on then? I just don't know. We established there was no aircraft approaching and realised then that what we were seeing was something that was a little bit out of the normal. This is weird. They would describe a light that they could see that would be moving north over the hills beyond Blenheim and we would see coincidentally a target on our radar that was also moving north at the same time and made us think that perhaps these things were related to each other. What we were seeing was controlled movements and the large light was like a mothership controlling two satellites. It's spinning around now. Have you got any idea what it is? Sorry, Blenheim. We're as baffled as you. We were sure they were an aircraft because they were flying in too tight a pattern. And secondly, no aircraft had been notified to us as being airborne that night. They would had to have had a clearance from me to operate. I know what the sky is all about. I know an aeroplane when I see it. I know uh, a meteor when I see it. I know a star or a planet when I see it. And what we saw that night was none of those things. All efforts to identify the strange objects failed. And then the mystery deepened. Two planes were buzzed by UFOs in separate incidents on that same night. One of the aircraft was flying south over the Kaikoura Peninsula towards Christchurch. It was piloted by Captain Vern Powell and First Officer Ian Perry. Look here, we got company. There shouldn't be anything out there. Wellington Air Traffic Control, this is Argosy SAF. Can you confirm an aircraft in front of us? We can't make radio contact, but we've got a fix on the radar. We've been tracking them for three hours now. There's a glowing light just in front of us. Hard to say what range it is, but it's definitely airborne. 
There's nothing scheduled to be out there. What on earth is it then? The effect on me was uh, prickling at the back of my neck. That soon ceased when I realised that we weren't being attacked at all, that it was just out there. The target tracked with him for 40 miles in the same position that we saw the radar return Vernon and his co-pilot saw a large white light which tracked along with them. It was now 4 a.m. After trailing the plane, the object disappeared from view. The next shock came as the crew prepared to land at Christchurch. All systems ready for landing. Flaps 20 degrees. Switched in radar. But what the hell was that? Up there! You noticed a blip on our radar screen that went across from right to left very, very fast far quicker than an aircraft with a very, very bright light, and it was streaking across from right to left. God, look at the speed it's going! We figured that it must have been at least 15,000 kilometres an hour. The radar operators at Wellington Airport couldn't believe what they were seeing. We tried everything we could think of, and playing with our radar controls to get rid of the target, to see if we could rationalise it, to sort it out. We couldn't. Something was happening, something unusual that I hadn't seen in my years as an air traffic controller. I'm a trained pilot, have been flying for very many years. We've got to know what aircraft lights look like and what the lights of cities are like. And this light that we saw on that particular night is nothing like we've, I've ever seen before. But the most dramatic moment of the night came as another freighter flown by Keith Hine was buzzed by an unidentified object. Argosy SAE, this is an emergency call. The object is heading straight for you. Take avoiding action, now! I must confess I was a little uh, apprehensive at that stage as to uh, just what was going on and what its intentions were. And then that began to move back in towards us and at quite a rapid speed at one stage it was on an intercept course with us. Somehow a collision was avoided, but nothing could stop news of the night's events leaking out. A news crew led by reporter Quentin Fogarty flew in to okay. cover the story for Australian TV. I really thought all we'd be getting would be some footage of uh, pilots at the control, interiors of the aircraft, no more. But within minutes, the trip took an unexpected turn. Up here, quick! There seems to be something out there. Dave, are you getting this? I got it. When we got onto the flight deck, we saw this string of lights, three or four, sometimes as many as five lights. What do you think they are? I don't know. They definitely shouldn't be there started as a small pinpoint of light, and then they'd grow into this large pulsating globe with sort of tinges of red and orange. And they'd, they would sort of keep that shape for a short time, then we'd go right down again to a little pinpoint. I just sort of sat there transfixed, and then I thought, hold on, I'm up here doing a job, I'm a journalist, so I started doing just a wild commentary onto tape. Mary, are you ready? And David was doing I'll his best to film. Dave, you stay on it. OK. The people in the aeroplane were seeing lights in the sky where the radar was reporting. There, there was the same correlation between radar target and uh, nocturnal light that was present on the previous occasion. The strange light show ended after 15 minutes, and soon after the plane touched down safely in Christchurch. The freight was unloaded but the crew still had to face the return journey to Wellington. Quinton? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to let you down, but I, I don't want to go back on the return flight. What? I don't believe in little green men or spaceships or anything like that, but that night there was something out there. I know it's unprofessional, but that's the way I feel. I could understand that she didn't want to go back, and I must admit that even I was a little bit apprehensive about getting back on, but it was such a, a unique opportunity. And the rest of the film crew was in for another surprise shortly after takeoff. I thought that whatever we'd seen wouldn't possibly be hanging around anymore, but we'd that? just taken off and we were summoned to get up onto the flight deck. When what it was out there is back. There out to the starboard side was this great, great white bright light. That was the object that features mostly on the film and that was the one that uh, was analyzed. We were told later it was about the size of a house. I had a very good view of it. Just a very bright light and it seemed to change shape. Every so many seconds on the film there was a red ring went round this object. Went 
As the plane was coming north, once again, when it was in range of Wellington radar, there was correlation, good correlation, between what the radar was seeing and telling the airplane was near them and what the airplane was seeing out the windows. What's going on? We're turning to face the thing. We want to find out a little bit more about it. Look, it's moving with us. It moved off to the starboard side again, so it appeared at that stage that it was under some form of control. Back down to Earth, the film report sent shock waves around the world and sparked a debate that continues to this day. Skeptics claim the images came from everyday objects on the ground, in the sky, or out at sea. An investigation by the New Zealand authorities suggested the objects could have been fishing lights from squid boats, planets, or even moonlight reflecting off fields of cabbages. But all the witnesses are adamant none of these explanations add up. It certainly wasn't a, a squid boat. I never seen one at 13,000 feet up in the air anyway. Venus hadn't risen, so I, I don't know what it was. The air crew could have seen the light reflected from cabbages, but I've never known cabbages reflect on a radar screen before. And certainly, I'd like to know who was growing cabbages 20 miles out to the southeast of Wellington, well over the sea. I know what uh, Venus looks like, I know what planets look like and stars look like, and it was definitely none of those things. So what did all those witnesses see back in 1978? I wish I did know what I saw, but I've got no idea. I can only tell you I saw targets on my radar that I can't explain. I believe that, that the only logical explanation is that it didn't come from the planet Earth. They were unidentified flying objects. Things from outer space, I don't know. Does anyone? Look outside on a starry night, and if you say we're the only ones alive in this universe, I'll call you the biggest egotist ever. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our stories. Tonight's programme is the last in the series. Strange, but sadly true. See you again soon. Good night. <laughs>